Hi, I'm Dot Porter at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, and this is the presentation that I gave last week at the International Congress on Medieval Studies in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, last week being sort of the second week of May. Um, this talk discusses work that we're doing here at SIMS on virtual collation. There was a lot of interest um, during and after my talk, and a lot of people have been asking me questions, and so I thought I would um, make this uh, screencast video um, just to sort of, you know, so people who weren't actually present can sort of see what, 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 I, what, what we're talking about. This um, paper was co-proposed with Will Knoll, although, although he wasn't able to make it to the conference, so I just presented on my own. So this is basically um, what, I, what I did there. So I started out my talk by with this with this image, right, and talking about how when I was first starting out, sort of after graduate school and in my first in my first job, um, I got to know Ben Withers, and he came to the University of Kentucky where I was working, um, and he was interested in doing a digital, some making some kind of digital resource with Cotton Claudius B four from the British Library which is this illustrated Old English Hexateute manuscript. And as I was becoming familiar with that manuscript, I read, I read his book. And at the same time, I also first read The Harley Psalter by Will Knoll, who I didn't know Will at that point, obviously. Um, but I, I really enjoyed both of these books. They're very good books. But I had, this, I had a problem in that it was, it was difficult for me to visualize what they were talking about often when they're describing the books. And both of them go to, to great you know, they, they try really hard to sort of um, explain very clearly this is what's going on. Both books have a lot of images in them, images from the manuscript as well as figures sort of explaining um, technical details. But, um, but I thought to myself, even at, at this point, which would have been sort of in the later 2000s, you know, how great it would be to have some kind of tool where you could actually just bind, you know, take the manuscripts apart virtually and look at them in their pieces. Um, now, when you, when you look at digitized manuscripts right now, usually what you're doing is you're looking through um, some kind of uh, page turning interface. And this is uh, eCodices. I really like eCodices. They have a very clean, easy to maneuver uh, interface. It also um, has, does something nice. So this is, a, this is just an opening in, in the manuscript. You know, you've got the um, verso on the left and the recto, or the next recto on the right. Um, in this one, if you hit the one button up here on the corner, it will actually flip the recto over, and you can see the recto and the verso at the same time, which is of one page. You can see the front and back of a page at the same time, which is kind of interesting. And not all not all page turning interfaces do that. Um, you can also view all of the thumbnails. At once, and so what these two views sort of do is you can see up close. Here's what the opening looks like. In the case of the codices, you can see the front and back of a page at the same time, and then you can see with 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 this view, the thumbnail view, you can sort of see the manuscript in aggregate, right? You can get a sense of where are the where are the illustrations distributed, and and how many you know what the margins look like on all the page, and are they consistent or are they are they different, and do things change, um, you know. Uh, through, as, you're, as you're moving through the manuscript. What neither of these do, really, is give you a sense of the manuscript as a physical object. In both of these, well, really all three of these, it's, you know, what you're doing is you're taking the images, images of pages. You're, you're, you're showing a manuscript as though all it is is these pages. And in the case of the thumbnails, it's like you've almost, you know, you've excised the pages and you've strewn them across the floor and you're looking at them like that and you sort of lose the sense of the book as a physical object and so what I you know what I was interested in in thinking about this work is is coming up with some kind of visualization that um, gives you the sense of the physicality of the book an understanding of an intellectual understanding of the of the of the book as a physical object without actually trying to recreate it in any virtual sense. So I, I didn't want anything that was like, I'm going to virtually recreate the manuscript in, in a computer. Um, I don't really like that. Um, and I've, I've talked about, I've talked about that in other, um, 
in other places before, so I won't go into that. So last year in April of 2013, I was hired here um, at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And one of the first things that, um, that I talked about with Will was this idea that I'd had that's been brewing about, about you know, creating something. And he didn't really seem to understand what I was talking about when I started, but he said, you know, go ahead and, um, and start and we'll see where it, we'll see where it goes. And I was really in a, in a lucky position and that part of my, part of my job here at Penn is doing this kind of work. So I didn't have to get a grant. I didn't have to really make it, make a case. I mean, I wanted, obviously I wanted his backing on it, but you know, I have a portion of my time that's just my research time. And so this is what I was this is what I decided I wanted to do. I'm also very lucky at Penn um, to have some great collaborators here, and I've also been able to bring in other people on this project. And so this is um, this is a list of people. There's me. It's my idea. I kind of know where I want to go with it. I also have enough sort of technical training to be able to do um, work with you know data, figuring out data formats and XSLT to be able to work you know moving between data formats. Um, Doug Emery is our digital content programmer here at SIMS, and he's been really helpful, particularly with, also with, um, you know, talking through issues of data formats and transformations. Alberto Campagnolo um, is a book conservator currently at the Vatican. He's also a PhD candidate at the University of the Arts in London, and he's working on his dissertation on visualization of bindings. So uh, when, when I, I announced on a listserv, you know, whatever, six or seven months ago, that I was interested in this project, in, in doing something with this, and he got in contact with me and said that he had SVG that he'd been working on. So he's been um, doing some of the visualization work, and I'll talk more about SVG in a few minutes. And then Don, Dennis Mullen is our web developer here, and he, he's a web developer who's also a web designer, and he makes very beautiful web pages, and so he has been responsible for the look of what we've come up with. Um, so I came up with some sort of not very beautiful ideas, and then he took them and made them look nice, which is, I think, it's nice to have something that looks nice. So when we first started with um, the visualizing collation 0 0.1, so when we were very first starting, we started by looking at um, collation formulas. And the idea at that point was, well, why don't we have a system where we can actually feed a bunch of collation formulas in and sort of do it at scale, right? Do a mass batch, put in collation formulas and spit out a visualization. Um, we started working with the digital Walters materials. Uh, one, because it's available, right? So they're sitting out on the digitalwalters.org. They're uh, open access licensed, so they're really easy to, to get. You don't have to worry about copyright or anything like that. And the second reason we wanted to use those is because most of these, most of the um, manuscripts that are, manuscript descriptions that are up there do have collation formulas, and they are fairly standardized. Um, so this is an example of a collation formula as used by uh, the Walters. And you'll note that it, it's fairly, um, fairly clear, so every choir has a number, one, two, three, five, six, and then the number in the parentheses will tell you how many folios that choir has. So here, choirs two through five have eight folios, choirs 12 through 18 have eight, choirs 10 through 11 have six. And then if there's a page that is lacking, either because it's been taken out or because it was never there or because its conjoined page was added, then there's a, a minus with the number. So there's no indication of what, of what that actually means, whether it was taken out or whatever. It's just to give an idea of the structure of this. And this was actually, I'll talk about it a bit more, but this caused some, there was a lot of discussion around the collation formula as we were moving forward. So the first thing that we did is we, rather Doug, wrote a script that took this collation formula and made it into something that the computer could act upon made it into some different code. And this is what this is what we did. So we have a choirs uh, tag, and then every choir has its own tag with a number. So here's the first choir, two, three, four, five, six. 
and then positions is the number of folios in that choir. So you can see 2 through 5 have 8, and then 10 and 11 have 6, and then all of these have 8. And then if there's a page that's missing for some reason, then it's in this less tag. So this is basically, that's that, made into computer readable code. And then Alberto took, took this input from Doug and wrote a script to create SVG files for each choir, illustrating each choir. And this is just what it looks like in my, um, on my computer, in my file system. So W5, you know, we feed that in and then every choir gets its own SVG file. SVG is, it, it's an image format, but it's written in XML. And your browser takes that XML and converts it, it into, an, into an image that you can look at. Uh, it's different from, a, from like a JPEG, which is its own, its, own, its own file that sort of sits by itself and you can't really get inside it and mess with it. Whereas in SVG, you can change the way it looks like you can change the way it looks by going in and changing the XML. And when you open one of those in your browser, this is what it looks like. This is what you, what you see. Um, so this is choir six. This is the one that has eight folios, but the fifth one is lacking. So you can see the fifth one is, you cannot see it. There's a little bit of it here. You can't see it here. Then the other ones are all fine. So we got this far and we were actually really really pleased with this. We're like, okay, this is, this is basic. But then there was so much more that I wanted to do with this because the choir, the choirs don't exist in a vacuum, right? This is describing something. It's describing part of a physical object. And I wanted to bring that object into it. So not just looking at the choirs, but then linking it up with images and other, and other things. And so I decided, okay, we're going to put that aside for a second, we're going to jump into Collation 0.2, which is um, starting, instead of starting from the back end and starting with the, with the formula, um, trying to determine what I want the front end to look like and how I want it to act, and then the idea being that once I have that set, we'll work towards the middle. And so really what I'm presenting here is Collation 0.2, and this is what it looks like. So this is... Um, Cotton Claudius B4, the first choir, which is a choir of eight with the one lacking. And, you know, so here's the, the first bifolium, which the first one is missing, the first, rather, the first folio in choir one is missing. Um, and so I, I, we say that that's X, and then seven is there. And then here's what it looks like, and I'll actually click this and we'll open it up on my on my computer so you can see it in action. So here's there, I think is this pretty clear, X and seven recto and seven verso and X. And then here it is. And you think of it, think of it as flipping it over. So maybe it's a little easier if we come in. So this is one, one and six. This is the bifolium one and six. So here's one verso and oop, six recto. the inside bifolium and then if we click on it it's like it's like you've got it you've got a sheet and you flip the sheet over right so we've basically disbound this this choir um, here so that's essentially that's essentially how it works and then you work your way in and here we have three verso and four recto which is an opening in the book and this is the only opening in this whole page otherwise it's just conjoins um, sort of spliced together so you can see um, how they would look if you, took, if you took the book apart. So I was pretty happy with this and I thought, well, what are, what are some different use cases that we might have for the collation, um, this kind of collation work? Um, there's this sort of thing where I just want to take one book and, and look at it, a single object. Um, you could also potentially use it to compare copies of each other or, or compare a, a book with its exemplar. So I pulled in the Harley Psalter and the Utrecht Psalter and um, I thought this might be interesting. Again, just a couple of, just a couple of choirs for each one just to see what it might look like. And it, it functions the same way. It didn't work quite the way I wanted it to because actually the, the two Psalters have uh, quite different collation structures, which in itself might 
might be interesting if you're if you're interested in how you know how the one was copied from the other um, knowing that they were actually really different and seeing you know what what precisely those differences are between them could could be could be useful the other thing that I really wanted to do with this and I was sort of excited to, to get a choir in um, was something like the the Archimedes palimpsest is a good example so a book that was you know that existed historically in some way and has either been broken apart and um, lives in different places, something like the Codex Sinaiticus, or something like the Archimedes Palimpsest, um, which is uh, currently it's in the form of a, of a I think a 13th century prayer book. Um, but that prayer book used to be a book of some uh, texts of Archimedes. Um, and what happened was, some, you know, sometime before this prayer book was written, the Archimedes book was um, scraped, all of the text was scraped off, and then it was rotated 90 degrees, and then it was folded up and made into this prayer book. And so what they, what they did in the Archimedes Palimpsest project was to disbind the 13th century book and use special imaging to bring out the text. And they also, as part of that project, um, recreated the, the original collation. And so what I've done here is I've taken their, the collation that they came up with as part of the project and connected it with the, with the images um, that they have as part of the Digital Archimedes uh, project. And it's kind, of, it's kind of neat. So you can see you know, what, what this look, looked like um, originally. And then, well, I mean, obviously not because it's it's been broken up and it's got special it's has special imaging, but but that and it's kind of I think this is really really interesting because it, again it it takes this physical object that doesn't even exist anymore and gives us a way to sort of to sort of look at it um, in its in its structure, and then the last um, use case that could be interesting is is fragments of, of manuscripts. So in this case, this is a fragment from the Rylands Library, um, which is a, it is, it's, it's a piece of Chaucer. And they just have this one by folium. And according to the catalog information, they say if it were in an eight, um, in an eight leaf choir, it would be two and seven. So I stuck it in here. I don't have any of the other pieces. Um, there, might, there may be other pieces um, in another library, but this is um, this is it. But even this is sort of interesting because you can see one, you can see where it sits in the within the context of its choir, and you can also see how much of it is missing. Um, I know sometimes when I'm when I'm looking at fragments, I'm not I'm thinking about the fragment. I'm not thinking about how much is missing, and this could you know give you a, a sort of way to look at that. So that is. Um, so that's what it looks like right now and how it functions. And coming back here to the PowerPoint, right, and just again, here are the, there are those use cases that we just walked through. So next steps, of course I have next steps, right? What I have, essentially what I have right now is I have a process for creating those SVG files that show the structure of each individual choir. And then I have a template that you can use to, you know, make a website using this. And so I could just keep using the template, um, which means that every time I want to make a new, a new choir, really, I have to copy the template and then fill it in by hand, which, let me tell you, is, is not really the best way for somebody to spend the time. What I'd really like to do is come up with a way to generate, generate those sorts of sites um, automatically. And there are a few different ways that you could do that. One way would be to build on the collation formula work that we've been doing. So if you, you put in a collation formula and, and then it spits this thing out. You have to put in other information as well. But basically that. I'm uncomfortable with that because of the discussions we had around collation formulas as we were um, working through the first, the first part of the project, which I sort of mentioned. There was some... You know, for one thing, there's there isn't really a standard collation formula in manuscript studies. So if you if you look and you 
you know, open up the book next to you that describes a manuscript and it'll be, you know, likely there will be differences between the way that that collation formula works and one from the, from the next book. Um, and I don't know, I don't want to get caught up in a, you know, what collation formula should we be using or should we have a standard collation formula? Um, because once you have the visualization, the formula you use to get there doesn't really matter. What matters is what's in front of your face in terms of what you're looking at. Um, we've also sort of thought about making recommendations for TEI to put collation information in. And again, I don't know that it matters. People use TEI in a lot of different ways in the manuscript description area, and and I think it's fine. And TEI, I mean, there was actually a, a, um, a working group for physical bibliography several years ago that, that actually touched on some of this, I think, and, and they didn't, you know, that was never implemented, and I don't know that it ever will be, and, and I don't know if, again, if that's like a fight that I want to fight. But what I did think is, well, what if I had a, what if I just put a form up that described um, these, you know, described what I want to have on the, in the final view and just get away from, you know, formulas and code altogether and just have a form where you fill things in. So, you know, you put in my manuscript here, and this is just a mock-up. This doesn't actually do anything. A base location for manuscript images. Manuscript file names I haven't even talked about, but of course that's an issue because um, particularly, now if you, if you download images and have them on your own server, you have some control and you could rename them if you wanted to. All of the ones that that I have um, stored, the ones that I'm pulling from, all of them actually, except for the Archimedes Palimpsest, are on, are, are on my own private server. And um, I just renamed them to zero, you know, zero, zero, one, recto, dot, JPEG. And that was really, that was the simplest way to go. The Archimedes Palimpsest ones, because they're being served from Archimedes, I have to use their file naming, which is very complex. And so that's really, um, that's going to be an issue. Um, but here I just have base location for your manuscript. So, so I'm just going to leave that blank. And then um, build your manuscript. This is just a Google form. Ideally, I think it would be in some form of maybe JavaScript where you could say at the top, you know, how many choirs do you have? And you could say, I have 12 choirs, and then it would give you 12. Um, and so choir one, let's say, has eight choirs, and it's not missing any folios. Let's say choir two has 10 choir, 10 folios, and we're missing five and, I don't know, eight. Choir three is, um, I don't know, has eight and so on. And then, you know, you get to the bottom and you submit it and here nothing happens, but I'd love to have a great big button that says, you know, this bind my manuscript and you push it and it chugs along for a minute and then spits out a, basically a website that has, you know, a page for each choir. I think that would be really great. And that's really where I want to go with this. I don't want this to be just something that, that I have for myself. I'd really like to be able to share it. So that's where we are, and I hope this was, this was interesting. If you have any questions, you can email me. My email address is there, and the website for the Schoenberg Institute is schoenberginstitute.org. And thank you very much, um, and I will, yes, keep working on collation. <laughs>